Hello and welcome. My name is Jen Ruggalo and I am the SCA's Curatorial Director. I know that title probably doesn't make much sense in light of today's topic, but I have worked in and around the World Coffee Championships for a decade now. I used to work with World Coffee Events as the Marketing and Communications Manager, but more importantly, I also co-led for, for a period of time what was formerly known as the Instructional Development Subcommittee of the Judges Operations Committee. In other words, I worked extensively on the training materials related to judging for world and national level judges. It's kind of a precursor to the Competition Strategic Committee that uh, now operates today. Now, a lot of time has elapsed since uh, I was a part of that initial sort of group back in 2013. Um, and today in my current SEA role, I have been involved in our long-term project to evaluate and evolve the cupping protocol. So when questions came up about how we might want to introduce some of these ideas into the World Coffee Championships, I helped to bridge the gap. I used to spend a lot of my free time volunteering to stage manage at the world and national level in between the time I used to work for WCE and the point at which I started working for the SEA. So that's why I'm here with you today to present on the scoring and evaluation updates that were made to the World Barista Championship and World Brewers Cup rules and regulations for 2023. First, I want to start with the questions that this session will answer. Where did these changes to scoring and evaluation come from? Second, the rules and regulations mention an SEA project on coffee value assessment. What is that about and why is it relevant to the World Coffee Championships? Third, what are sensory testing best practices and how will they be applied to the evolved cupping section of the value assessment? Which is directly related to question number four, how will this be integrated into the World Coffee Championship scoring and evaluation practice in 2023? So clearly we have a lot to cover in this session. I'm just gonna jump right in. Let's start with our first question. Where did these changes to scoring and evaluation come from? I always find it helpful to start by reviewing some vision and mission statements of the organizations and groups who support and develop the World Coffee Championships. Let's start from the broadest vision to impact these changes and move to the most specific. First, the Specialty Coffee Association, the parent organization of World Coffee Events, which is the event management organization founded to manage and organize the World Coffee Championships. The SEA's vision, mission and focus is to foster global coffee communities to support activities to make coffee a more sustainable, equitable, and thriving activity for the whole value chain. It does this by uh, acting as a unifying force within the specialty coffee industry and works to make coffee better by raising standards worldwide through a collaborative and progressive approach. Now, you'll note I've bolded some words here and I hope you'll see why later. This is a good chance for me to note or a good time for me to note that a key element of the SEA's five-year strategy is the integration of its sustainable coffee agenda into all of its activities. And so really, if we're thinking about this from an SEA perspective, some of the changes that are made this year is an effort to take some of the really exciting, cool things that we're learning over on the knowledge development side and to apply them to the competitions because they're related to the sustainable coffee agenda. Now let's review the vision for the World Coffee Championships that the Competition Strategic Committee uses to guide their work. I've mentioned them earlier, but if you're not familiar with the Competition Strategic Committee, they are a volunteer leadership group with wide ranging experience of competition and industry. And they meet regularly throughout the year to collaborate on strategic initiatives that foster and support the competition community and to keep the competition moving forward. This kind of strategic initiative uh, sort of talk, it includes things like updates to competition formats, rules, regulations, judges, sponsorship, marketing, communications, it's the whole thing. Now, this is a list that we sort of identified as some of the priorities of the Competition Strategic Committee for the rules and regulations update this year. The top three apply, I think, across the board, but especially to these two competitions. And then at the bottom, uh, they're a little bit color coded. We've got brewers on, on the green side and barista in blue. Um, and those are the more specific goals that we had for each competition there. So just really quickly to go over these, I'd say that, uh, you know, the first thing was to the best of our ability now, ensure that the changes we make are expansive rather than limiting. And what I mean by that is to say that uh, we want to be able to iterate as we go. We don't want to make a big sweeping change in a massive way that locks us down a path that we kind of can't go, hey, you know what, this doesn't quite work for everyone. And um, so it, you know, we need to backtrack. We want to, we want to be iterative as we go. 
Uh, second, we want to begin to integrate some of the logic underlying the SCA's forthcoming system to assess copy value, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And third, we want to always provide clarity to existing rules and to integrate expanded sections as to how competitors are evaluated as copy professionals. Now, in particular for brewers, this year we were looking to refocus the competition to evaluate brewing and not coffee. And we also wanted to remove the surface level connection to the old cupping protocol. That speaks a little bit to sort of number two on this list, but is also something I think we've been looking to do for a while. And on the barista side, we wanted to allow competitors to make the most of the tools available to them. And we wanted to finally be able to introduce the use of plant-based beverages in the milk drink category, something we'd had on the evolution roadmap since before the pandemic, and that just got delayed with everything that came with it. I'm going to close the section by going deep on the very specific evaluation changes and the vision for these. Now, why did we make these evaluation changes? If you're here, chances are you also are aware that the World Coffee Championships are what we perceive to be the biggest, broadest outreach into the community. It's a really valuable tool for solidifying and broadcasting a shared language of specialty coffee. That's what they were designed to do at the very outset was to help build skills and to set definitions for coffee. And now we have the SEA as an organization that sets standards and the competitions don't need to do that anymore, but they have the biggest, broadest outreach in that capacity. We have so many competition bodies and we have so many people who participate in competition who are enthused by it and who want to learn more about it and use that as a stepping stone to for their coffee career. Now, in particular, as the Competition Strategic Committee was already making large structural changes to the Brewers' Cup, we propose the implementation of additional core changes that mirror that underlying logic of that system to assess coffee value. The goal is to use these changes as a stepping stone for possible further alignment, but we always wanna take time to consider and test. So we've made some small tweaks in some cases and a few larger ones, particularly in Brewers' Cup because those changes were already coming. Um, and we just wanna see how it goes and we would like to hear your feedback and to know. Now. Really interestingly, the World Barista Championship already employed just a little bit one of the core ideas at the heart of the value assessment system and some of the changes we're making to cupping specifically. This is called a discrete task approach, and judges already use this when they're evaluating a competitor's beverage. Many of the updates this year are the result of a focus on Brewer's Cup because, as I said, it was the competition with the strongest connection to the existing cupping form. But there are other opportunities to integrate elements of this logic into other competitions. We're just not going to do it yet. Remember, iterative approach. So at the close of this section of our presentation today, I hope we have effectively answered this question, which is, you know, where did these changes to scoring and evaluation come from? They are related to the core mission and vision of both the SEA and the World Coffee Championships. And they are specifically related to the SEA's work to integrate the latest sensory testing best practice into an evolved cupping protocol and form. With me? All right. Let's move to our second question. The rules and regulations mention an SEA project on coffee value assessment. What is that about and why is it relevant to the World Coffee Championships? Now, you may or may not know this, but the last time the SEA updated the cupping protocol was back in 2004, so almost 20 years ago, and that was only a very minor tweak from its initial appearance in 1999. The cupping protocol has become an industry standard since then, which means it's been used by lots of different people in lots of different places as a shared vocabulary to share information about a coffee and make sure that it translates across uh, geographic locations, uh, value chain roles, etc. Standards should always be reviewed and updated regularly, which hasn't been done with the cupping form and protocol. It's been 20 years since we've touched it. So we began sort of talking about this and thinking about it almost four years ago. And in the meantime, a lot has happened. Broadly speaking, evaluation took place from 2020, following some discussions in 2019, uh, all the way into 2022. And then this year, I'd say evolution has begun specifically for the Cup Informant Protocol. I'm really quickly going to walk us through the highlights of what we've learned during this initial evaluation process before we look at the specifics of the forthcoming changes to the form and protocol, and also explain a little bit why we're talking about this in relation to the World Coffee Championships. 
I want to start with this white paper. It's an attributes-based definition of specialty coffee. It is foundational to the logic underpinning our next steps at the SCA in terms of what we're doing to build the value assessment system. But it's also important because it helps us to understand the sensory testing best practice, particularly when it comes to defining what we call attributes. Now here, like I said, I'm gonna give you the five bullet points you need to know about this white paper in order for us to sort of look at this in the context of the World Coffee Championships. First, that attributes are the essential building blocks of what we currently define as a singular standard of quality. There are two types of attributes, intrinsic and extrinsic, both of which add value to coffee. Intrinsic attributes are things that are related to the coffee itself. So uh, things like the bean size, the color, uh, flavor is an intrinsic attribute. And extrinsic is information about the coffee. So where it was grown, who grew it, uh, whether or not there's a certification attached. And the idea is that as a coffee has more of these distinctive attributes, it becomes more valuable in the, more, in, the, in the marketplace. So more distinctive attributes, more special. Now, not only can attributes and their value be measured, but we can also begin to better understand markets using this view. And this is because the attributes-based definition or understanding allows for different people or markets to value different attributes. It doesn't say that there's a single sense of what's good that is true all around the world. It says different people value different things, and by identifying those little building blocks, we can understand who values what and where and by how much. So the most important thing for you to know about this is that it is simple, it is measurable, and it recognizes value. The next thing we did was a literature review, and this began in mid-2020. Um, it was the SEA's chief research officer and our technical officer who completed a review of the existing literature at the intersection of coffee and sensory science. This review was published a year later in 2021 as the SEA's Coffee Sensory and Cupping Handbook. And it is a very long book and it's very thorough. I spent a lot of time working on it with them, and um, it's, it's a wonderful book. I has it, you know, I, I know I'm perhaps a bit biased, but it really does bring a lot of information together. But again, I'm going to give you the, the top five points here that you need to know in order for us to progress through. The first is that remember how we said in the attributes based definition, there are two types of attributes. Well, we're going to use a different set of bucketing here, and we're going to say that there are three types of attributes that we want to be able to track. Descriptive sensory attributes, effective sensory attributes, and extrinsic attributes. Remember, extrinsic was the same in both. Second, that later sensory science advises against combining descriptive and effective assessment types. And we know now that the existing form and protocol does combine these two, so that's not a good thing. We learned that having a lexicon and references is really important when it comes to backing up descriptive sensory analysis and descriptive assessments. And we have this courtesy of World Coffee Research and their sensory lexicon. Uh, we've learned that cuppers can be good descriptive panelists i.e. they can take away their sort of sense of what they prefer and just say what is in a coffee. And we've also learned that cupping scores are ultimately an effective rating, even if it's meant to be what we're calling intersubjective, which means to say that, okay, so you can calibrate and maybe you're calibrating to a market's preferences, but those market preferences are still subjective. The other thing we did was conduct some user perception research. So in the same time frame, from about 2020 to 2021, the SCA commissioned a research project to better understand how members of the coffee industry use the protocol and its perceived strengths and weaknesses in assessing coffee's value and sensory attributes. The first part of this research was an online survey of about 1,600 cuppers with over 80 countries represented. I think about 26% responded in Spanish, 53% in English, 6% in Korean, and 15% in Chinese. The second part consisted of, of semi-structured interviews with 47 cuppers, and these were chosen across a matrix of value chain role and geographic region. The goal of the research overall was to amplify the voice of the users and to particularly focus on voices that have not always been included in projects of this kind. That is to say, coffee producers and those who work in coffee producing countries. Again, here is our high level overview of what we learned here or what's captured in this document. One, that the specialty coffee industry has become global and diverse since the form and the protocol were first launched two decades ago. 
This may not seem obvious to you, but it's been a long time since we've looked at this in any official capacity. Two, the need for more descriptive sensory data and for this data to be relevant to the cupping score. Third, we learned that sweetness is incredibly important when it comes to determining a coffee's value, but we also know nothing about it. Um, and four, that there are, of course, many areas of the existing form and protocol that could be improved, and we captured a wish list of these items. So now, as I mentioned, we're at the evolve stage and we got here because based on all of that work before we understood a vision for where we wanted to go and what we wanted to do. Now, again, here we are specifically looking at the cupping protocol element of the value assessment system. First, we collaborated with World Coffee Research on a study to examine how cuppers cup so we could explore the potential impact of the proposed evolution. Early results arrived just in time for Expo and RICO last year where they were presented. And if you'd like to read more, there's a feature on this in issue 18 of 25. The results of this study confirmed that our evolution plans were on the right track. So we then moved to the alpha or pilot testing phase where we designed several different forums and began testing them in small groups with an emphasis on coffee producers and professionals working in coffee producing countries. We are now working on finalizing a beta version of this form and protocol, which will launch in April this year. Now, we're not retiring the old cupping form yet, even though we know it's complicated and maybe not the best tool. But we know this will impact lots of people and we want to move slow. As it is used in 2023, we will continue to refine and then we will move into our new rigorous standards creation and review process, at which point, once approved, it will replace the current cupping form, likely sometime in 2024. So with this, our goal is simple. If we can measure the attributes in coffee, we can better assess coffee's value and therefore understand what specialty coffee actually is and how it's being valued in the marketplace. It is through this understanding that we will be able to not only make coffee better, but help producers fetch better prices through a more transparent value discovery system. And finally, I wanna remind us of something we actually covered in the section before, which is that the World Coffee Championships are the SEA's biggest, broadest outreach into the community. So if we have one tool already that is fantastic for solidifying and broadcasting a shared language of specialty coffee and specialty coffee experience assessment, as we're working to evolve this other huge, broad tool for solidifying a shared language of specialty coffee and specialty coffee assessment, it makes sense to bring these two together. So, at the end of all of this, I hope we have effectively covered why, um, like what the rules and regulations meant when they said coffee value assessment, what it's about, and why it's relevant to the coffee championships. Now let's move to our third question. What are sensory testing best practices and how will they be applied to the evolved cupping section of the value assessment? There are three different kinds of sensory tests we can do discriminative sensory tests, descriptive sensory tests, and effective sensory tests. And in order to explain these three different tests, I'm going to share you uh, with you a sentence that I think lots of us have used in some form or another while we've been tasting coffee. I tasted three coffees. I liked the third one. It tasted floral and sweet. It was the best. So that top sentence, is a discriminative claim. I tasted three coffees and I liked the third one. It's kind of a yes, no question. It tasted floral and sweet is a descriptive claim. It tells us what the coffee tasted like. And then the, it was the best is an effective claim. It tells us what we liked about those coffees there. So it's a, a, a subjective preference. Now, why does this matter? And again, I'm focusing on this uh, in terms of the cupping form specifically because the Brewer's Cup was built so much on the cupping form, but I promise we will get to a point where we are looking specifically at what is going on in both the Barista Championship and the Brewer's Cup. So looking at this image here, this is color coded to show us where the effective portions of the form are, where the descriptive portions of the form are, and where the discriminative portions of the form are. And you can see that it's a mishmash of all of these different things. And so we have a mix of subjective and objective tests 
in the same place. One of several studies, and in fact, I would say a lot of sensory scientists even have moved on from this particular study in 1980 and agree even more uh, strongly now than ever that combining tests is not a good thing. But I'm going to use this uh, reference because I think it is the, the clearest in terms of what we're talking about here. Misuse of sensory tests can occur when more than one sensory test objective is combined in a single test, i.e. you're doing something descriptive at the same time you're saying whether or not you like something. Each test type requires a different psychological set and behavioral task from the subject. Combining tasks increases the risk that responses on one task will influence responses on the other. And another quote just to kind of keep in mind, the human brain lack the architecture lacks the architecture to perform two or more tasks simultaneously that is to say we may think we're really good at multitasking but really our brain is just flipping back and forth um, between tasks really quickly we're not actually multitasking at any given time so with this in mind we are introducing what is known as a discrete tasks approach to the evolved cupping protocol we're working on right now this splits each type of assessment into its own task, which will then be completed independently of one another. Now, before I move to the next few slides, you know me and my disclaimers, you will soon see some screenshots of the evolved cupping form in reference, but I want to make it clear that these screenshots are of an early alpha version of the form that we have been piloting. They are not the final form or even the beta version of the form that is going to be released in April. This beta version will be released more widely for use and feedback at the Specialty Coffee Expo and Rico Symposium in Portland, Oregon. And if you're going to be joining us in Portland, there will be many opportunities across Rico seminars, expo workshops, expo lectures, and I think even a little bit in the cupping room itself to have access to a form to try it out while you're cupping, where you can learn more about the beta version of the form and even in some cases to try it out for yourself. Okay. We're going to go back to the discrete tasks approach and I'm going to start talking about uh, descriptive assessment. When I say descriptive assessment, what do I mean? I am talking about a quantitative sensory test that seeks to profile a product on all of its perceived sensory attributes. It's important to note that descriptive assessment is an objective test. It is not based on liking or quality. It identifies sensory attributes, ideally using a standardized familiar vocabulary, something like the WCR sensory lexicon, and it utilizes the references from that vocabulary for a shared understanding. And rather than assessing performance uh, against sort of yourself or anything, performance can be assessed against other trained panelists. So if I am trained and you are trained and we are both saying that the same thing is in the same coffee, we are good to go. Now, in terms of the descriptive assessment we're going to be applying for the evolved cupping protocol and form, this will be based on the World Coffee Research Sensory Lexicon and the SCA and World Coffee Research and UC Davis flavor wheel. It will use what is known as a check all that apply and intensity scale approach. Um, and this data can be validated uh, with quantitative descriptive analysis panel. So this is to say um, that it it will follow these guidelines and we're going to be able to test this with coffee people but also with sensory scientists and they should align that's the goal now remember this is an alpha version of the form we are releasing the beta version soon this is not the final product but all of these elements will still apply in the beta version they just look different so important to note that we have our category here our intensity scale in terms of uh, how intense the fragrance is or how intense the aroma is those check all that apply terms and space for freely elicited notes. Hopefully we'll have some more space there. We're working on it. Um, so this is kind of what this looks like in practice when you're thinking about it in terms of a cupping form. Now, effective assessment. This is the second box of the two boxes of cupping uh, that's sort of when we said the discrete tasks approach. An effective assessment is any method to assess acceptance, licking, preference, or emotions for a stimulus or stimuli. So really, an effective assessment is asking questions. Do I like it? Is it high quality? Descriptive assessment answers the question, what does it taste like? But effective assessment answers a different category of questions about preference and liking. 
In coffee, we have developed a term that captures the essence of effective assessment in a coffee cupping, and we call it the impression of quality. The impression of quality is a coffee taster's opinion of the distinctiveness and desirability of a coffee sensory category reflecting either their own preference or a known market preference. And you might notice this because we have introduced those new impression scores into both the Brewers' Cup and the Barista Championship. More on that later. This is how a cupper switches from describing the coffee's sensory attributes to expressing their impressions of the coffee quality. This process relies on a cupper's expert opinion developed through experience. It's important to remember that this assessment, like all effective measures, is subjective. It might reflect a cupper's personal response or a no market preference, in other words, predicting other people's effective response. Importantly, you would not expect perfect alignment between cuppers on effective measurements since they are based on individual or market preferences, which are diverse. And this is, in fact, what we've seen across many of the bits of the research that we've done for this project, but also just generally a diversity in effective measurements in the coffee world. In our next phase of the coffee value assessment, we're planning on introducing a formal effective assessment to accompany the descriptive assessment in coffee company, cu coffee cupping. This will be based on the concept of impression of quality, and it will use a nine point hedonic scale. We have figured out a way to translate the hedonic rating to the familiar 100 point coffee scale, and you'll see more of that when the beta test goes live. Um, and we're really excited about the potential of this tool, and we know it will help us paint a much clearer picture of coffee's value. So again, here is a screenshot of an alpha version of the form. But here you can see we have the same categories as what will be done in the descriptive. We have that nine point hedonic scale and the keywords that are associated with it and space, of course, for notes. So closing this section here, uh, I hope we have effectively answered this question. What are the sensory testing best practices and how will they be applied to the evolved cupping section of the value assessment? And just to recap, separating different kinds of sensory tests is, an incredibly, is incredibly important to avoid the different tests influencing one another. So the best practice is to employ a discrete tasks approach by separating the descriptive sensory tests, that is what sensory attributes does this coffee have from the effective sensory tests? That is, do I like these sensory attributes? Now, I think we're on question four. <laughs> um, that's all well and good for the evolution of cupping, I hear you say, but what does this mean for the World Coffee Championships? How will this be integrated into the World Coffee Championship scoring and evaluation practice in 2023? Well, first, again, I'd like to remind you of a slide I showed what feels like a very long time ago, which said that the World Brissa Championship scoring and evaluation actually already employed a basic discrete tasks approach. And what did I mean by this? Well, the WBC score sheets split out accuracy of descriptors from taste experience, not only in the rules, but on the score sheets. Um, not only in the score sheets, but also in the rules. Sorry. Just at a basic level, let's talk about accuracy of descriptors, and I am going to start to talk us through some of the changes for this year. So when a judge is asked to evaluate the accuracy of descriptors, a judge will listen to the descriptors and the explanations given by the competitor and compare what they have experienced with what they have been served. The judge scores how accurately the given description matches their own experience, and this had been scored with a zero to six, um, but is now marked with a zero to three score. And this is because we're trying to bucket things a little bit more easily for judges, uh, but it can be categorized quite similarly to that zero to six score. So one is sort of would be a previous acceptable average, two would be a previous good, very good, and three would be a previous excellent, extraordinary. This change in scoring approach more clearly indicates a difference between the accuracy judgment and the experience judgment. Now, in terms of sensory experience scores, this is the sort of taste or tactile experience score currently scored on a zero to six scale in the WBC and the new performance assessment score, which is the impression score, which is a new zero to three score. For experience scores, judges evaluate the overall experience of the beverage, including the components as well as the beverage preparation. 
And although it's not explicitly on a nine point hedonic scale, the zero to six point scale that the World Coffee Championships use is already fairly closely aligned. And I will show you this more clearly in a few slides. For the impression scale, we're doing the same thing. Uh, it's a narrower version of the scale, but it corresponds quite highly to the zero to six scale that judges are already very familiar with, judges and competitors are very familiar with. And this is applied um, similarly to that zero to three descriptive score for accuracy. But I just wanna recognize that when we're talking about the impression score here, it is very much a subjective measure of the judge's impression. What does this look like on the score sheet? in 2022. Now, here I have highlighted the descriptive and effective tests as they appeared then. Uh, so red is descriptive and blue is effective. I think I've kept that color coding fairly consistent throughout the presentation so far, but you never know. Um, and you can see that the descriptive tests account for 33% of the total score and the effective tests account for 60%. This giant <laughs> mess of numbers is a screenshot of one of many different spreadsheets we did this year when we were considering changes to the categories to to evaluate and their respective weighting. So on the left, you'll see the categories and weighting of the 2022 rules and regulations, and on the right, you'll see the 2023 rules. Categories that were highlighted in gray or that have a line through them have been removed. They are no longer applicable in the 2023 rules. And looking at the percentage of total score in the very right hand column of both, uh, but particularly focusing on the 2023 rules, you'll see some color coding. Green boxes are weighted more heavily in 2023 than in 2022. Those sort of orangey red boxes are weighted less heavily. And the dark green box, darker green box, I suppose, down at the bottom in barista evaluation uh, sort of section for coffee knowledge and equipment is an entirely new category. So taking a look at this very broadly, you can see that the 2023 rules have a decreased emphasis on accuracy of descriptors, i.e. those things are now a little bit less weighted, and an increased emphasis on the taste experience and barista evaluation uh, sections. And those are the things that are highlighted in green. You may also notice that while a competitor's espresso is still the most heavily weighted element of a competitor's performance, the total scores for, for a competitor's espresso evaluation is now only 30% of a total score, followed by signature beverage at 25%, milk beverage at 20%, and barista evaluation at 18%. And this is how those changes are reflected on the 2023 score sheet. First, you can see there are just generally fewer categories, uh, but also that the sheet has been rearranged to more consistently group different groups of sensory tests together. You can also see the change in the weighting of the different kinds of tests. The accuracy of descriptor scores, a descriptive sensory test is now weighted to 25% down from uh, 33%. The effective scores, which include the sensory experience scores, as well as the scores for presentation, are increased from 60% to 74%. Now, not all of this change is to do with weighting changes alone. This weighting was also impacted by the removal of categories like visually correct in the milk beverage section or appropriate attire in the brist evaluation section. With the removal of those, the weighting's also just generally adjusted. And when we zoom out, you can see the rearranging of the score sheet to more clearly reflect a discrete tasks approach even more. So there are clear spaces for a judge to know what a competitor tells them they will experience in the descriptors category um, and a separate space to record their own experience in the experience section. Now, it's important to note that while these are more clearly separated on the score sheet, we're not wholly embracing a discrete tasks approach here. That would require a completely different format. Um, what we are doing is leaning into what was already present within the competition and just pushing up the volume just a little bit. Before we move into how this impacts the Brewers' Cup, I want to spend a little bit of time first on those new zero to three scales we're using in 2023. So starting with the descriptive assessment, uh, accuracy of what is presented, because we are essentially working with references, although not the same kind of sensory references we talk about when we are talking about the cupping form and protocol. But in this case, a barista is telling us what we should taste. Um, and then we're evaluating whether or not those things are present. This is set up to be an objective score. Think of it like a yes, no, but with a little gray area if someone has hit some things, but not all. Um, so a zero would be nothing to evaluate. That is, the barista didn't say anything at all. 
two, uh, one would be not very accurate, which was the previous sort of acceptable average uh, type score under the zero to six. Um, and that is, let's say somebody gave some descriptors, but they weren't, they totally missed the mark, but they tried, you know, they, they gave some descriptors, that's important. So that would be a one. Uh, somewhat accurate, which falls under the old categories of good, very good. So maybe one of those was spot on, but the other one was not great, in which case uh, that's probably a somewhat accurate or it's kind of in the ballpark, but not quite there. Um, and then three is very accurate. And that is to say, you know, all the descriptors that were given, they were pretty nailed. Uh, they're very good. And so we're going to call that very accurate. And in this case, too, we are these are broad buckets, right? So the, the goal here isn't to distinguish between strawberry yogurt and strawberry mousse. It's a strawberry and a dairy thing. And that's good. Right. So that's very accurate. Now, in terms of effective assessment, we are also using that new zero to three scale for the impression of quality or scores related to a judge's personal and subjective sensory experience. Previously, all of these kinds of scores were done on the zero to six scale, but there are some categories where the competition strategic committee felt the scale could be tightened uh, to make it a little bit easier to score. You'll find these scoring scales used in things like visually appealing in the milk beverage section or attentive to details in the Brista evaluation section because sometimes it feels a little bit weird to sort of say that someone has is you know very good but not excellent on attentive to details how do you make that call so this new zero to three score should make that a little bit easier and all it's applied in a very similar way to the accuracy of descriptors in the sense that uh, zero is none to evaluate i.e you know, beverage wasn't served or didn't meet the rules and regulations to uh, as a defined beverage um, one is the like not very uh not very visually appealing or not very attentive to details two is somewhat somewhat visually appealing somewhat attentive and three would be very very appealing very attentive and then finally this is the zero to six score that has consistently been applied in the world coffee championships since i think their inception so like the zero to three impression scale we just reviewed, this score is used when a judge is evaluating their personal experience of a beverage or of a presentation. And they need a wider sort of measure because it does make sense then to distinguish between very good and excellent or average and good. Now, let's talk about Brewer's Cup. If you remember at the start, this is the competition which has changed the most as a result of those five objectives outlined by the Competition Strategic Committee for this year's evolution. Let's start first by looking at the 2022 competition's weightings. Notably, three of the categories in brewed coffee evaluation are worth double, that's acidity, body, and balance. And there is only one category that we could say is descriptive, a single bucket that covers lots of the categories above. 14% of the score is based on descriptive assessment and 84% of the score is based on effective assessment. That's a pretty big gap. Now, you may remember that one of the evolutionary goals for Brewer's Cup in particular, it was not only to integrate some of the new sensory best practice uh, and or coffee value assessment logic, but it was also to shift the focus from brewed coffee here sitting at a whopping 68% of the score to the competitor at 32%. And just as a quick reminder, this is what that looks like on the score sheet. So we have a big wash of blue and just a tiny little section of red down there in terms of what we're looking at or assessing in terms of descriptive uh, tests. There were quite a few changes between 2022 and 2023 in terms of which categories are evaluated and how they are weighted. First and most noticeable, there are now six descriptive categories to correspond with each of the coffee evaluation categories, which we will cover in more detail in another presentation. I am aware that I am taking up a lot of your time already. There are also three new competitor evaluation categories, and these are well explained and prepared, customer service and hygiene, and presentation. This shift changes the balance of descriptive and effective tests from 84% effective to 14% descriptive to 26% effective and 71% descriptive. Nope, sorry, 26% descriptive and 71% effective. I've got my numbers mixed up there. Um, and this is a similar ratio to the World Barista Championship. That's not super important, but it's just nice to know we're in the same ballpark. 
More importantly, it decreases the weight of coffee evaluation to the total score. Last year, 68%, this year, 46%, and increases the weight of competitor evaluation from 32% to 54%. So this was in line with the desire to have the competition evaluate the competitor and their ability to brew coffee rather than evaluating the coffee itself. And to be clear, like the competition wasn't designed to evaluate the coffee, but that's what we've seen sort of happen in practice recently, or that's what it feels like, and that's what we've heard. Uh, from competitors and from judges. And what do these changes look like on the new score sheet? So here you can see we've got a hugely expanded uh, descriptive section and it corresponds directly to the impression of quality when, we, when we're thinking about the uh, uh, hedonic preference for the coffee that's being served and the brewing method applied. So just as a reminder, we are here using those zero to three accuracy and impression scores. They use the same nomenclature. They are applied very differently. But here's where the big change is when it comes to the brewed coffee evaluation scores. On the left are the previous coffee evaluation scores based on the old cupping form. You'll notice it's a pretty narrow range and it uses quarter points. So oftentimes people weren't really even scoring below I don't know, a certain point, like we, we weren't using the whole score. Um, and on the right, we have the full nine point hedonic scale that will be used in the evolved cupping protocol that sits within that coffee value assessment system. Now, again, one of our goals was to remove any superficial ties to the cupping form, but also to integrate some of the same coffee value assessment logic in the sense that we want to use sensory, apply sensory testing best practice, and uh, we want to be able to use this as a tool to help people teach or help people understand some of the changes that are that are making um which is the i think the point of the brewer's cup from the very get-go was to help explain sort of then to teach the cupping form and protocol uh so we went back to that zero to six point score that we use at the world barista championships and we realized actually there's quite a lot of overlap between that six point score and the hedonic scale because that zero to six point score doesn't actually recognize things in between average and unacceptable so here you can see them mapped uh, directly. So you have one acceptable is actually kind of a slightly low, two average is five, neither high nor low, three good, slightly high, very good, moderately high, excellent, very high, extraordinary, extremely high. It maps really well. Um, and so this is what we are going to be using for the uh, Brewer's Cup coffee evaluation score. And this is what it looks like when we're pulling these together. This is what was proposed and what was accepted by the Competition Strategic Committee. Um, and so we are using, like I said, that same zero to six point language, but begin to get people sort of used to thinking on that zero to nine point scale. So those words are in brackets this year. And with that, I think, <laughs> I know I've flown through this a little bit, even though it's been quite a while. Um, I hope I have answered our final question here, which was how will this be integrated into the World Coffee Championship scoring and evaluation practice in 2023? And that is to say that in both competitions, this new zero to three score have been introduced, one of which is for accuracy of descriptors and one is for impression of quality. Score sheets have been rearranged to bring different types of sensory tests together. And uh, as in like we're taking the sensory tests and that we're we were sort of flipping back and forth and we're saying we're going to we're going to put like with like. And in the Brewer's Cup, judges will no longer use that zero to 10 scale from the old cupping form, but will adopt a zero to six score with language based in the nine point hedonic scale that will be used in the evolved cupping form and protocol, which which sits within the expanded coffee value assessment system. And of course, finally, in both competitions, changes reemphasize rewarding the skill of a competitor. So at about 45 minutes, I think we have covered all of the things we intended to cover today. I hope I have not gone too fast and I am confident we'll, we will be doing more of this or opening the floor for some questions in another format at another date. Um, I hope this helps to explain some of these changes and I really appreciate your time and attention listening to me run through all of this information. Thank you very much. See you soon.